And I, I want to talk briefly about going back to why the war happened and um, basically what, what is generating this and what's perpetuating the occupation. When we have people like Abba Zaid coming out and talking about, well, we may well be another 50 years in the Middle East and the leading uh, three so-called Democratic presidential candidates in the United States, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, John Edwards, all three of them theoretically um, opposed to the war by their party affiliation. That's kind of a joke. Um, have all three already come out and taken the, 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 the idea of discussing immediate unconditional withdrawal of all occupation forces from the country. They've taken it off the table until after their first term if one of them comes into power. So they won't even talk about it until 2013. So why, why is this? And I, I want to read another short bit from the book that I think illustrates it as, as good as anything. And on this week, there are countless, countless topics we could discuss. But I want to talk about Halliburton. And the, the brief context I'll give for this is uh, it was in December 2003. And again, so we're talking seven months into the occupation, not long. And already we have gas crises that are... Uh, uh, exacerbated by lack of electricity because there was no reconstruction happening to the benefit of the Iraqis. There was lots of reconstruction on bases, military bases, but there was no electrical infrastructure, water, medical, nothing like this happening. So and one reason a gas crisis is so critical in Iraq, when you don't have electricity and then you're buying gas, um, gasoline-powered generators to run uh, a fan or a, a, a light at night or maybe a refrigerator to store food, it makes living uh, a bit more complicated and difficult. So that's why, particularly in Iraq, uh, where gasoline, you know, you could say a lot of bad things about Saddam Hussein, but one thing you can't ever be critical of was uh, that there was always plenty of gasoline and it was always extremely cheap, but not so under the occupation. And so that's, that's the context for this next uh, couple of pages I'd like to read. And it's just me and, my, me and my interpreter at the time. Uh, we were walking back to our hotel. We passed a small, decrepit petrol station. <coughs> Excuse me. With, with two lines of cars <clears throat> stretching as far as we could see, waiting for gas. There was a separate line for black marketeers who were lined up with jerry cans and plastic jugs awaiting their chance. The black market was burgeoning. Those who could afford the extra costs were less willing to wait in the ever-lengthening lines as the gas crisis worsened. The black marketers took their plastic jugs to the petrol stations, filled them, walked down the street a few meters, and used siphons and plastic funnels to pour gas into the empty tanks of those able to pay a little extra. Everyone from small children to elderly men on crutches were doing this. Uh, meanwhile, short-tempered Iraqis were jamming their cars toward the pumps, some having slept overnight in their cars in order to keep their place in line. And the Americans try to tell us this war is not about our oil, yelled a man pushing his car. He agreed to talk with us as long as we stayed out of his way. Even under that bastard Saddam, we never had benzene shortages. I'd seen these lines all over Baghdad. Gas lines were so thick in some areas that traffic would often get choked down to a single lane, further aggravating the already impossible chaos of Baghdad's auto congestion. <clears throat> Some of the men we spoke with in the fuel line were aware of the fact that Halliburton subsidiary, KBR, had just been caught by the Pentagon for grossly overcharging them by importing gasoline into Iraq from Kuwait at $2.65 per gallon. Iraqi concerns were able to do the job for under $1 per gallon. Halliburton, which had Dick Cheney as its chairman and CEO from 1995 to, to 2000, before he relinquished his position in order to become vice president of the United States, was unabashedly looting the Pentagon. By this time, Cheney's old company, which he still had financial ties with, and has, had obtained billions of dollars of contracts in Iraq. No one knows exactly how much money has been contracted in total, but as of the time of this writing, Halliburton's overall contracts for log cap and oil infrastructure rebuilding have totaled approximately $20 billion in Iraq. Total expenditures on U.S. corporations operating in Iraq on reconstruction and other services is about $50 billion. 
LogCap is a logistics civil augmentation program with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which is Halliburton's largest government contract. Under this contract, Halliburton is responsible for providing supplies and services to the U.S. military on a global basis. Services include construction of military housing for troops, transporting food and supplies to bases, and serving food. So, pause. There's, according to the Department of Defense, there's over 736 U.S. military bases around the planet. Halliburton has the contract of supplying, doing construction on, and servicing all of those U.S. military bases around the globe. It's a pretty sweet deal. It's worth noting that it was Dick Cheney as Defense Secretary in 1992 who spearheaded the movement to privatize most of the military's civil logistics activities. Under Cheney's direction, $9 million was paid by the Pentagon to KBR to conduct a study to determine whether private companies like KBR should handle all the military civil <laughs> logistics. That's in the club, too. KBR's classified study conveniently concluded that greater, greater privatization of logistics was in the government's best interest. Big shocker. Shortly thereafter, on August 3, 1992, Secretary Cheney awarded the first comprehensive log cap contract to KBR. The Washington Post reported at the time, quote, the Pentagon chose KBR to carry out the study and subsequently selected the company to implement its own plan. Three years later, Cheney became CEO of Halliburton. And then to finish the linear progression, so he remained CEO of Halliburton up until 99 when uh, George Bush is, uh, announces his, he's going to run for President of the United States. And a committee clearly is, needs to be formed, as is uh, how it goes in the United States, in order to try to decide and choose, okay, who's going to be his running mate? Who's going to be his vice president? So Cheney volunteers to, to, to chair that committee, and then he chooses himself. And then literally the day before he's sworn in as vice president, he steps out of his CEO position. And then the next day, he's sworn in as vice president. And here we are. I think that's pretty clear. Um, to up, a, a quick update on that, uh, former Halliburton subsidiary KBR uh, has received so far now contracts in Iraq totaling well over $20 billion. And a Pentagon audit of $16.2 billion worth of KBR's work found that at least... $3.2 billion in KBR billing was either questionable or completely unsupported by documentation. Another big shocker.